Hi there, it's Callum Newman uh, here for today's Insider. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, your regular editor, Greg Canavan, has asked me to have a little chat with my colleague, Catherine Cashmore. Now, we might begin, actually, some of you may not know who Catherine is. So, Catherine, can you tell us who you are and what it is you do here? Hi, Callum. Um, yes, well, I... Um... I, I do three things actually in in Australia. I uh, run a buyer advocacy company, so I buy properties for investors and home buyers and overseas investors. Um, I'm president of the oldest economics organisation in Australia called Prosper Australia, where um, I have my foot on the other side, <laughs> where we work very hard to make housing affordable, to work on tax policy, to analyse how tax policy affects land values, how it affects the land cycle. And we um, look at a lot of historical data for that and all of international data and inform government and policymakers and try and do something to change policy. Not that that, that does much um, in Australia. Policy is pretty set on uh, pushing house prices higher rather than making them more affordable. And then, of course, the other thing I do, Callum, is um, write for Portfolio Publishing, Fatale Media, um, with you, uh, with cycles, trends and forecasts, where we look at the land cycle in particular and how that affects both the property market and the stock market. And then obviously I write Cashmore's Real Estate Wealth to really teach people on the intricacies of how they can actually make wealth from the land cycle. Well, one reason we're doing this today is because we still have people who are sceptical of the current property market, which is fair enough, but there's lots of things happening as well. But I want to read you a quote from a familiar source. So an old mate of mine uh, sent this to me. Uh, so this is from Harry Dent, who was quoted in the news today, uh, uh, recently, I can say. Uh, now, some of you will know the name Harry Dent. He's a sort of forecaster, author, um, kind of guy, macro strategist, and has been forecasting uh, a down market here in Australia for quite some time. But this is what he was quoted as saying uh, recently. Once you get bubbles of this extent, there's no way to stop it. They have to come down to reality. I'm telling you, it's 30 to 50% for real estate in most countries, and it's 60 to 90% in stocks in most countries. This is going to kill most people's retirement portfolios. Unquote. So, Harry, very bearish. Um, that kind of call still finds an audience. You're on the ground here in Australia following the property market. What should people make of it right now? Well, he's right in one sense because obviously at some point it has to come down. I mean, you can't have this kind of um, growth that goes on in perpetually, you know, that, that just carries on and carries on. And we, we never have had. Okay. So, I mean, but the, the point, I suppose, that we emphasize in, in what we talk about um, in Cycles, Trends and Forecasts is that there is a very specific and readable and obvious cycle to land that if you study it, then you understand how that pattern works. And that pattern really hasn't been broken um, very often. Uh, it's it existed for a long time and in Australia we synchronize with that cycle and we have quite a few more years to go before we see anything that is going to cause the market to fall that significantly. So for a property market to have that kind of percentage fall, one thing has to happen and that is that everybody has to sell at the same time. There has to be a flood of foreclosures that hit the property market. Everybody has to panic and start selling. That happens at the end of the cycle that, that we talk about, the 18-year cycle, um, because at that point, usually what happens is that there's mortgage, um, the, the debt is very high. The productive sectors of the economy have been eroded away because a lot of investment has gone into land and unproductive investment. And then the interest rates are raised at the end of the cycle. Of course, you're paying um, your mortgage out of your earnings. And uh, the, what happens at the end is, is at some point, you people just can't afford to pay the debt. They can't afford to pay their mortgage payments. At, so, at that point, normally mortgage fraud is unco uncovered within the banking system. Um, people can't, you know, pay, pay the payments, and then the 
the, you get this flood of sales that hit the market, the property prices begin to plummet, there's a panic that goes, that happens, and then the prices dip below the loan, the funds that have been loaned out in the banks, and you get um, a property crash. But for the percentage of the property crash as to how far it has to crash, well, again, it's extremely difficult to read, and it does depend on what happens with policy at the time. I'm probably going a little bit too far ahead if you want to kind of pull back and just focus on this question, but <laughs> what what we're saying is no, right, right now, that is not going to happen. So it doesn't mean we can't have a pullback in the market. Um, but if you're looking for some kind of shock, similar to what we've just been through with COVID, something that is going to trigger a large number of people selling, that's not what's going to happen at the moment. No. Well, it's funny you mentioned COVID because I know some of the feedback uh, you've got from buyers and just uh, some of the comments I've seen online and that is people are, are now like, if COVID couldn't even stop the Aussie property market, what would stop the property market? Um, now, if you're watching this, um, you should know that we spoke to a guy called Fred Harrison, I mean, Catherine and I spoke to a guy called Fred Harrison in the middle of, of the, the COVID downturn. Now, he's a, a property cycle expert and uh, someone whose work we draw on. He said quite clearly, and you can go and look it up if you're a member of Cycles Trends and Forecast, he said property will resurge back from this because there's so much money being pumped into the system. And that's part of what we're seeing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think because people are saying, well, if COVID couldn't do it, what will do it? I mean, COVID didn't do it. The Royal Commission didn't do it. <laughs> the, you know, the, the GFC didn't do it. The biggest global synchronized recession that we'd, we'd had since the Great Depression. Uh, and, and if anything, that's just going to breed confidence to make the next downturn, which we do predict will crash property prices even more severe because people will get overly confident about investing in property. But I mean, what's going on under the surface with COVID is, is COVID could you know, it, it wasn't that it was impossible for COVID or something like that to do it. it, it the, the, the crisis itself wasn't the timing for the property market to crash. And so it didn't. But it doesn't mean that government policy can't affect property prices one way or the other. Had we had a complete full lockdown of the real estate industry, had they raised taxes on land, um, you know, there's things that, that can be done which can cause price downturns, as we saw in 2018 with the Royal Commission into the banking sector. So it's not that we're getting overly confident here, but what we're essentially looking at is a cycle that has a very distinct pattern to it. And that is that, um, you know, you've got this significant downturn that you get as part of the 18 year cycle. And this wasn't the timing for that, but the next downturn is predicted to affect the property market. But there's so much fuel to this fire, Callum, that, that we're seeing now. I mean, everything that you're seeing now is incredibly predictable and it's very, very easy to, you know, I mean, last year we had um, heaps of writers that were saying, oh, the property market's going to crash 20, 30 percent. Um, you know, this is it for Australian property, you know, run for the hills. Um, we know now that it didn't. But of course, all those analysts have now turned around and said, oh, no, now it's going to rise 20 percent this year in Sydney. It's already done that. It already did that in um, Auckland, in New Zealand. It doesn't mean in that everywhere is having a great time globally um you know there's there's other cities in the world which really are having a, a bit of a tougher time with their real estate markets but um the the rise in australia has a number of drivers to it that we can just quickly talk through if that's okay please do yeah okay so we've got the uh, money being a liability so the lowering of of um uh, interest rates lowering of lending rates People really don't know what to do, do with their money. That's obviously, you know, causing a boom as anybody would be, as a five-year-old child would be able to tell you that it was going to do. We've got the stamp duty cuts that are going on through, um, you know, different states and governments are giving uh, enormous benefits to home buyers. So they're really fueling the buyer side of the market with the home builder program. So the new estates have gone absolutely crazy land prices in the new estates with people queuing and sleeping and camping overnight to a degree that we have never seen before um, to buy so many lots that are on the market that the big developers release drip feed onto the market so they would rather give you 30 lots and they've got like 14 years land supply at their belts but um, so that's going on in the new estates we've got the, the stamp duty cuts obviously you cut stamp duty it pushes up, up uh, prices 
massive global infrastructure spend, um, the biggest uh, spend ever in Australia um, on infrastructure is happening right now. You, infrastructure always increases land prices. Put a train station in the suburb, the land prices will take the gains around that station. So all of those things are feeding into this at the moment. But then, of course, you've got things like um, fractional uh, uh, systems where lots of people can get together and buy real estate and added to that is the blockchain and the crypto which is also feeding into the real estate boom where people are able to um, use that form of currency to go and and purchase property so um, this has got a long way to go yet yeah, there's nothing that's going to put what the only pullback that you could perhaps speculate is to do with just localized things like job keeper will that affect the market we're not really sure it's more likely that if they pull back stamp duty in the home buy grants that definitely would have a bit of an effect um, on the market because a lot of people have rushed in a lot of buyers have rushed in and of course sellers a seller doesn't sell in a rising market right if you think that you can get more for your property six months down the line you're not going to rush to put it on the market today the only reason you ever rush to put a property on the market is when you're convinced that prices are going down and they're going to keep going down so short of shortage of stock essentially well it's interesting you mentioned crypto there not only will people be paying crypto <clears throat> they'll be plowing their profits in, from crypto into property uh down the line some of the the gains that are going on in the crypto space are, are enormous and some some of that is going to show up in property um very interesting. We have two angles to our what we do at Cycle Trends Podcast. We've got the property market, which is what you cover up on, and then I've got the stock side. Um, now, if you're watching this, you may not really think about it in this way, but there's lots of way to monetize this cycle cycle on the ASX. So we're talking builders, banks, brokers, uh, REITs, um, uh, even retailers. Anything that touches on the property market uh, can appear in the stock market too, as as profitable companies. And we got a really interesting example of that uh, just yesterday when a company called Mortgage Choice, which is a, a loan broker, uh, announced that it, want, it was going to be, or what a bigger company wants to acquire Mortgage Choice. So realestate.com.au, the company behind that, wants to acquire the the assets of Mortgage Choice to, to move into that um, a lending and broking angle uh, to grow their business. Uh, now that stock went up 60% on the day because the offer price was you know, much larger than the one that was on the market. Um, it indicates to what should be coming in the next year or two. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. What you alluded to earlier is the first home buys and home buying market um, being strong. At some point they're gonna get priced out and it's gonna be a switch over to the investors. Is that what you're expecting as well? Yeah, that, that's always how it works. So the investors are getting a little bit more active now, but uh, investor finance, it, it's a little bit harder. The banks haven't loosened as much as people might think um, for investors, particularly if you are self-employed, um, if you were hit with COVID, all of those things are going to um, play into the fact of how easy it is to get a loan. I expect even with the talk now about, um, you know, that they need to suddenly tighten the, the banking system, that's just not going to happen. They've spent a long time saying that we need to loosen it after the Royal Commission, not tighten it. And um, so at, at some point, it's going to get a little bit easier for investors to get access to finance. But at, at the moment, the, the weight of that is going to the home buyers. So that would be the pattern that we would expect. And not just the investors coming back in, but because the developers that have also found it very diff difficult to access. So now, actually, um, not wanting to sound like a sprooker, god forbid please <laughs> don't you know i know people um, love to label every real estate agent a spruker but um it really is a good time to get into the market if you understand that we are heading ultimately for a peak um 2025 2026 probably pushing to 2026 in the australian market so um in uh property prices and what feels expensive now and what feels crazy now isn't necessarily the end of it it's going to get a lot crazier as we go on through the years and if you you can look back just in recent memory and get a grasp of what we're looking at and that would be to go back to when the gfc hit in um 2008 and i remember because i was working for a family-owned business at the time um buyer advocacy business uh, and it really was a bad time in the real estate market we lost all our buyers they just disappeared everyone thought the property market was going to crash but 
um, Rudd came to the rescue with all his home buyer grants and, and so on, bailing out the banks and so on and so forth. Anyway, the, the market kind of didn't really, um, it, went, it went up on those grants, but then it kind of stagnated till 2012. And then between 2012 and 2017, we really had a very strong boom in Melbourne and Sydney. And it wasn't just for a year. It wasn't that prices started to rise in 2012 and then we got to 2013 and then it got to 2014 and everybody said, oh no, you know, they, it's like we've had this strong growth. Can it continue? Yes, it can. And if you look at the pattern of price growth, um, you know, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, but of course now we see that it's happening unprecedented in throughout Australia, regional and in the um, smaller capitals. Um, and that is that you can get strong price growth for four or five years. Um, and so this, what we're seeing right now, you know, it's, it's popular to think that the bubble's gonna pop but not yet. The timing's just not there. So it, it's if you just don't want to bet against what's going on when the government policy and everything is really cheering for the housing market to go higher. Well, I can broaden out two of those points. And one is that, well, anecdotally anyway, uh, a, good, a good friend of mine is a very wealthy man and he keeps going to the banks and saying, I want to buy property, I want to do development, and they won't give him a loan. He's a multimillionaire, and they, but they they can't tick a box because he doesn't work. He has an income, <laughs> um, like a job income. They won't give him a loan. Uh, now that's when you watch. Um, you can watch uh, on the ASX stocks like uh, Resimac, which are called non-bank lenders, who uh, securitize their loans. Um, so they're sort of outside the regulatory system. Um, now, because of low interest rates around the world, they're finding it very easy to, to float away those bonds. So there's large demand for Australian mortgage bonds out there that pay a good yield. So that's one thing to watch for in terms of financing. And a second one uh, that even around here in the area I am here, uh, you know, just at the top of the morning to Peninsula, you get those big blocks, um, they're all getting cut up. They're getting cut into two and three townhouses and the economics of those blocks still makes sense, don't they? And that's something that you talk about. Buying oh, 100%. Yeah, I mean, that that's, I think, what people don't realise. It's not just, um, you know, I always say to my clients that there's kind of three ways that you can value a house. And, and one is where you just look at the rental income, right? So you buy a block and you, you say, well, you know, the earnings of that block is what the rent is coming in. And the rent and the yields, particularly in Melbourne, not so much elsewhere at the moment, but in Melbourne, they're so low that you've got to hold on to the block for a long period of time before you get any money back. And so that's why they say, oh, look, we're in a, bo we're in a bubble because you've got to hold on to it for 30 years plus before all that rent is going to pay back, right, the land. So you're speculating on capital growth. The other one, of course, is a home buyer. You know, you buy it because of the schools and everything. And that's based on what the bank's going to lend you and the market. But the third way, you could actually say, well, land, in a sense, is undervalued. Because if you're a developer and you've got the, the uh, means to do it and you can go in and, and split a block up, say, into three and walk away with between 500 and 700,000, which in some cases is feasible. Um, it's a little bit less if you're doing it with um, just a subdivision of two, it's, it's a harder deal. But you know, in, in some instances, that is what is happening in the market. And in, in, when you start to do a feasibility that looks that good, that's where you would say, well, is property really overvalued? You know, because the earnings of the land are, are the earnings of the land are the um, sale prices of the development that you do now obviously those sale prices are also based on a speculative market the fact that everyone's money is rushing into it but yeah i mean i don't think people realize that the wealth that can be generated from land well no it's as i say i mean i just see uh so many examples on it but you have to be uh not queuing off comments like harry dent there uh, not to criticize harry he's a former colleague of ours but um you know he's based in the u.s um and and does a lot of his work on demographics um but right here everything we're seeing um stocks related to the property cycle are moving up um they, certainly recently i've been writing about the REITs. now uh, they were hit hard from COVID, but they seem to be forming a what we call a bottom pattern on the stock market um a lot of the bad news has washed through them now it's time the potential is for them to start rebuilding their earnings. Um, one thing I'm sure everybody's wondering about, 
is to touch a little bit on the shifts that COVID has caused in terms of, okay, we know about working from home, but how do you see like the commercial property market um, and some of the changes that have happened there? Yeah, the, it, well, the commercial property market, it covers a lot of sectors, of course, because you've got industrial land and retail and office and, um, you know, so, so that it, it covers a lot of different areas and it's affected each one very differently. And also that is very city specific. So when I talked about globally, you know, if you look in places like New York, the real estate market's been absolutely trashed. It doesn't mean that it's going to last like that. You know, things change and policy changes and when, you know, the the table turns for New York and population starts to get back in and opens, then you'll see a change. But of course, that's been the same in Australia, particularly with the work from home. Um, so the, you know, industrial land, some industrial land has been doing absolutely phenomenally well. Um, and then, you know, and some retail has, and then others have been doing, you know, <laughs> obviously the, the little shop on the shopping strip isn't, is really suffering. And, and it was suffering before we came into this because there's a change. So land, you know, the, the, the problem with, a, you know, land is worth its zoning really is what it's zoned. And um, when you're analyzing any block of land or anything that you're going to, you know, that you're considering buying or you're considering investing in, and that even goes into the REITs and what the REITs um, themselves, the, the stuff that they're buying, is what that land can be converted into. So to give you an example, in Melbourne, um, you know, because there was such an exodus from the offices and the CBD really has been hit hard. And, and again, this is a really good example because the apartments are in such a bad way um, in Melbourne in particular, uh, that it's, it's uh, and I've used this term before and I'm not, it's not an exaggeration, but it's an absolute apartment apocalypse. I mean, the rents are going backwards. There's a massive vacancy rate um, on all apartment stock. We have an oversupply, um, you know, unlike, again, unlike other markets, unlike markets in Perth, for example. So, um, and so because the office stock is in such a mess, the mayor of Melbourne has a task force where they're looking at turning the office buildings into residential apartments. And obviously that means tinkering around with the zoning and with the permissions and with the allowances. Now, if at any point that turns around and we suddenly get a stream of international students and our population growth in Melbourne starts to take off like it was before and the supply starts to get sucked up because there's not a lot of building activity that's been going on, um, you know, over the last last few years, then that could turn and then suddenly they become a good investment. So it, it becomes very intricate when you kind of look at the commercial market. You've really got to know what you're looking at and what you're buying and and judge the future trends. And it's a it's a completely different valuation as well when you're looking at it as a buyer, because you just can't always go off that speculative idea that someone's going to come along and spend more on it. Um, yeah, you know, the, like they are with residential property. All right, well, we've given a good little sum up here of how we're seeing the property market um, at the moment. Um, if you're watching this and you're interested to know more, you can uh, go to us on the Fat Tail website and check us out. If you're interested in perhaps subscribing, give the customer service team a call. Um, we don't have an order form available, I don't think, at this stage, so you'd have to ring up and just ask about it. But just Catherine's expertise is, is worth the price of the subscription alone. And thus far, the little portfolio we've uh, built up has been working really well as, as well. So we're thrilled to, to bring this to you today. And uh, we'll be back soon when Greg asks us to do another update. So until then, goodbye.